Christmas Tale. Mr. Boffins was sat comfortably in his favourite armchair by the fire in his living room after eating a superb Christmas dinner. The gentle, comforting flames of the fire warmed his body and he felt at peace. He was a man who rather enjoyed his food, but he felt that was an advantage in the cold winter weather as it added an extra layer to his bones. As a young man, he had been fond of skating and all manner of winter sports, and as he sat, he reflected upon the days when he was a much fitter man and able to race and spin across the ice on the fine, razor-sharp blades of his ice skates. Mr Boffin's thoughts drifted happily through his youthful memories, and he was just on the point of dropping off into a mild doze when, out of the corner of his eye, he noticed the door of the room opening. Slowly at first, followed by the sounds of a scuffle and raised voices in the hallway outside. The voices were very high-pitched and cries of, You go first! No, you must! I shan't! You must! You're the biggest! Never mind, you're the eldest! were heard. Curiously enough, Mr Boffins was not at all surprised at these sounds, but he did open his sleepy eyes and then sat upright with a start, when, through the door, as if propelled by some unseen force, who should come flying into the room but a large brown plum pudding. The pudding was smartly dressed, if a little old-fashioned in style, and his hat, which had been perched on the top of his very round head, fell off and rolled across the floor in front of him, so violent was the manner of his entry. His coat, also of a cut of bygone days, was of scarlet cloth with silk lining and his black satin trousers were cut to the knee with long silk socks covering his skinny legs. To complement the outfit, he wore smart satin garters and a pair of shiny court shoes with enormous silver buckles. Mr Boffin stared at him wide-eyed as the pudding proceeded to speak. Uh, I must apologise, sir, he began in a precise though rather hurried voice. I, I received a slight blow from one of my companions, as you may have noticed, which has been most damaging to my dignity, you understand, I am sure. And without further ado, he solemnly groped for his hat from under a chair where it had rolled. Mr Boffins, who had been unable to utter a word since the pudding came in, looked at him in mild astonishment. The plum pudding continued. I, I'm, I'm sure you are surprised at my visiting you without an invitation, but the circumstances are most peculiar, and therefore I must explain to you the reason for my presence in your delightful home. Without pausing for breath, the pudding went on. The fact is that we, the worshipful company of Christmas food, are about to celebrate with our annual ball, and you have been chosen as our human guest this year. We all know you are one of our most generous customers, and we wish to offer you a token of our gratitude. And with these last words, he bowed slowly and gracefully. Mr Boffins, who had somehow managed to come to his senses, said in a quiet and faltering voice, I, I really am most honoured, I assure you and attempted to bow back at the pudding. But as he was slumped in his chair, it just looked like he was nodding off again. The pudding didn't seem to be at all bothered by this and carried on speaking. It is a fancy dress ball, as you may have noticed from my outfit, and I represent super chic. And with this, he lifted a slender leg to show off his silk socks and shiny shoes. At this point, Mr Boffins did not dare question anything about this encounter, as apart from the fact that he had no idea what costume plum puddings were usually dressed, he had never been in the presence of one that could speak. My friends are waiting outside, the plum pudding continued, and he gestured toward the door with a wave of his hand, which Mr Boffins noted was weighed down by the many ornate rings he was wearing on each of his fingers. Oh, uh, please do invite them in, said Mr Boffins politely, to which the pudding smiled and said, I'm sure they would be delighted. I will ask them to enter. And he stepped gracefully to the door, had a whispered conversation with someone in the hallway, then came back into the room, followed by the strangest group Mr Boffins had ever seen. 
First through the door was a large turkey dressed in a rough tunic of animal skins with an enormous wreath of green leaves upon his head. He, Mr. Boffins afterwards discovered, was supposed to represent an ancient Briton. There were several sweet little mince pies, one dressed as a dancer with a short full skirt, pink tights and a wreath of flowers upon her head, and another was dressed as a baby in a white lace dress and sun hat with white socks and shoes. Yet another mince pie had come dressed as Joan of Arc in glittering armour holding a small but very sharp looking sword and accompanying the mince pies was a plump and juicy sausage, wearing a white muslin dress, tied with a white silk sash and a delicate rosebud on her head. She let out a squeaky giggle as she introduced herself as Sweet Sixteen. Another sausage then came into the room, dressed in a flowing gown and announced that she was the goddess Venus. When a third, even plumper and juicier sausage tiptoed in dressed as a fairy queen, it took all Mr. Boffin's resolve not to laugh out loud at the bizarre scene that was playing out before him. One by one, the members of the worshipful company of Christmas food entered the room, which by now was getting rather crowded. Another sausage, a gentleman this time, was dressed as the good companion in a brown and white dog costume and would occasionally bark in a remarkably lifelike manner for a sausage pretending to be a dog. A bottle of champagne skipped about dressed as a forget-me-not flower in a delightful costume of pale blue silk, and a bottle of port continued the floral theme by dressing himself in frilly pink taffeta as a sweet William. Mr Boffins stood up from his chair and solemnly shook hands with all present, whereupon they asked what costume he intended to wear to the ball. Uh, well, I, I, I really don't know, said Mr Boffins rather at a loss. I haven't got an outfit and I don't even know where I could, what I could go as. The plum pudding stepped forward. Uh, perhaps, sir, you would allow me to make a suggestion, he said politely. I couldn't help but notice a suit of armour in your hall as I entered. Uh, could you perhaps wear that and go to the ball as a knight? Mr Boffins didn't look convinced and said warily, well, I, I might, but I don't know if it would fit. Well, run along and get it and we'll see, cried the sausage dressed as Sweet Sixteen, who seemed inclined to be somewhat over-friendly and familiar. Mr Boffins reluctantly left the room to get the suit of armour, which he had bought at a sale several weeks before, but which he had hoped his friends would think had been worn by one of his ancestors. He struggled back into the room with the armour, and the company crowded round him and offered to help him put it on. They persuaded him to remove his warm cardigan in order to help him fit into the armour, which had obviously belonged to a rather slim knight. They helped him struggle into the top part, but there he stuck. It's no use, he cried. It is much too tight. I shall be squeezed to death. Nonsense, said the familiar sausage sternly. You'll be able to squash into it if you just put your mind to it. And with much pulling and pushing, huffing and puffing, Mr Boffins was squeezed into the suit of armour. The leg pieces fitted him much better, and he was assisted into these by the turkey and the plum pudding. Oh, I confess, sighed Mr Boffins, that, that I am not comfortable in this suit and I'm starting to lose the feeling in my legs. Oh, that will wear off, said the familiar sausage reassuringly. Wait until you've danced a little, then you'll be all right. I certainly hope so, said Mr Boffins doubtfully. And I am sure I will never get those pointed boots on, he pleaded as the plum pudding came towards him, carrying a pair of heavy, narrow steel boots. After much argument between Mr Boffins and the plum pudding, who felt the suit of armour would not be complete without the boots, to his relief, they eventually agreed that the boots just weren't going to fit, and so he would have to go to the ball in his slippers. And uh, now for the helmet! The plum pudding went on. Mr Boffins groaned, but the unstoppable plum pudding took the helmet and with the help of the turkey managed to fasten it upon Mr Boffins head. His muffled voice could be heard from the inside. Please open the lid, I am suffocating, it's full of dust. Finally, 
they managed to pull up the visor and Mr. Boffins peered out, his eyes and nose looking extremely dusty and uncomfortable. That's marvellous. Now you are ready, so we can proceed to the ballroom, said the plum pudding, and the whole party, with Mr. Boffins in their midst, set forth. They walked a very long way, it seemed to Mr. Boffins, through the hall and down the cellar. The sausages and mince pies chattered and laughed all the way, but the plum pudding and the turkey preserved a dignified silence, only volunteering a remark now and then to Mr. Boffins, whose armour was feeling tighter and tighter as he walked on. At last, when he felt he could go no further, they came to a large, brilliantly lit room, crowded with all manner of Christmas food, dancing animatedly to a merry tune being played on a harmonica by a banana. All round the room were dishes and plates on which some of the dancers were resting, and on a raised platform at one end, were many small tables groaning under the weight of food and drink. As Mr. Boffin's feet touched the polished floor of the ballroom, the rhythm of the music seemed to enter him, and despite his tight suit, he felt almost a boy again. The party which had accompanied him began to pair off and join the dancers, many of whom glanced curiously at Mr. Boffin's. Come and have a spin, old man, said a voice at his side and turning, he saw that it was the familiar sausage. I'd be honoured, replied Mr. Boffins, and seizing the sausage around the waist, he whirled her off onto the dance floor. He was soon hopping round and round most energetically, and the peculiar dance seemed to come quite naturally to him. The sausage was extremely light-footed, which surprised Mr. Boffins, as he didn't know a sausage could dance so well. Soon, however, his suit began to feel tighter and tighter, and he started to feel very uncomfortable. He carried on dancing, determined not to be beaten. So round the room danced Mr. Boffins and the familiar sausage, never pausing to rest. Then all of a sudden, he felt a stinging blow to his shoulder. Still, he continued to dance, but then came another blow and another. Then a distant voice cried, John, stop kicking me this minute. I shall leave the house if this goes on. What are you grunting and making such a horrible snorting for? What was this? Where were the sausage, the plum pudding, the turkey, and the rest of the worshipful company of Christmas food? Where was the brilliantly lit ballroom, the smooth polished floor, and the lively music? All seemed to be slipping away and becoming hazy to Mr. Boffins. The armour he could still feel was even tighter than before, so the familiar sausage's words had not come true after all. He threw out his hand and clutched at something. Let go of my hair, John! What has come over you? I, I think I really must take off my costume now, Mr. Plum Pudding, cried Mr. Boffins in desperation. What are you talking about, John? Mr. Boffins recognised the voice as that of his wife, and he replied helplessly, well, uh, Where is the ballroom, Mary, and the sausage, and the plum pudding, and the turkey? Don't talk nonsense, John. What ballroom? You ate the turkey, sausages, and pudding yesterday, and you haven't got any armour on. You must have been dreaming, and you've been snoring and kicking me black and blue. I don't understand, Mary, said Mr. Boffins meekly. His wife sighed and said, You over ate yesterday, and that in turn has given you indigestion, causing you to have a nightmare, of course. So it was all a dream, and there was no worshipful company of Christmas food or a glittering ballroom. Mr. Boffins arose the next morning a sadder and wiser man vowing to never eat too much Christmas dinner again.